Great, thank you so much. Um, so I will be, I have the pleasure of um, overseeing uh, the section on biomarkers and clinical endpoints where we're going to have um, three more of our uh, uh, collaborative networks um, share with them, share with us um, what they're working on and their visions with collaborating um, with imprint. The first group that I'd like to introduce is the Maternal and Fetal Medicine Unit Research Network um, funded through um, NICHD. We have the pleasure of having uh, Dr. Monica Longo with us, who's a maternal fetal medicine uh, physician expert. And she also has a PhD in preventive medicine and community health. Um, her research expertise really focuses on um, maternal physiological adaptations in pregnancy and the relationship with cardiovascular and metabolic diseases in the mother and the offspring later in life. Um, she joined NICHD in 2021 as a medical officer, and she also serves as the project scientist for the Maternal Fetal Medicine Network. We're also gonna have um, Dr. Rebecca Clifton join us. Um, and Dr. Clifton is an associate research professor of epidemiology um, at the Milken Institute of Public Health at George Washington University. Um, she has an expertise in maternal fetal medicine um, and prenatal diagnosis um, and um, serves as the um, epidemiologist and lead biostatistician for MFMU. Um, and I look forward to having them uh, share um, their work with MFMU with us. Doctors Clifton and Longo. Yeah, hi, uh, hi Dr. Chan and uh, Hi everyone, I mean, it's been an interesting uh, learning day. So thank, thank you very much for presenting all of this. So um, just, we will give you a brief overview of what is the maternal fetal medicine in network, which I believe most of you know, next slides. It has been uh, funded in 1986 and it has to address the need uh, to provide, do I drive the slides or you go? Okay. Anyway, I keep going. Needed to provide the infrastructure to conduct a well designed multi cell clinical trial. Thank you. In MFM, in a cost effective, timely, timely manner. Right now, it's uh, um, this cycle of maternal fetal medicine network is going to end in 2025. There was a need to change some of the infrastructure and there is going to be a kind of a new uh, change of what is defined a maternal fetal medicine network starting in 2023. And one of the first things will go for a site of seven years. Um, I'm pretty sure um, a lot of you know that the uh, funding announcement came out uh, um, sometime in May and is going to go for recompetition now with the, and the deadline is August 11th. Next slide. The aim of the, the purpose of the maternal fetal medicine network is to improve obstetric care, pregnancy and health, um, pregnancy health and outcome for pregnant and as we all have talked until now, lactating people and their babies by reducing maternal, uh, fetal and infant morbidity related to preterm birth, fetal growth abnormality and maternal complication and related to both the pregnancy during labor, the postpartum and the recovery. And by providing their rational for on evidence base for the safety and efficacy of therapeutic product using used during pregnancy and lactation. Next. The MFMU had as today very high impact on the practice. 25% of their paper have been cited and have changed medical guideline. The MFR network has published more than 384 peer-reviewed manuscripts and is currently formed by 12 clinical centers with a total of 165,000 births per year, a data coordinating center, and the NICHD. And they're all implemented and they're all working together on a very day-to-day uh, -day regulation of the, of the uh, maternal fetal medicine network. I'm going to let Dr. Clifton, the principal investigator in the data coordinating centers, to give you a little bit more detail of the specific operation of the network and the study that have gone until now, especially addressing the therapeutic uh, need that we have. Thank you, Dr. Clifton. Thanks, Dr. Longo. Next slide. 
Okay, so this slide just talks a little bit about the current infrastructure. So the MFMU network is governed by a steering committee, which includes an external chair, the center PIs, the DCC PI, and the NICHD project scientist. We have several committees, subcommittees, working groups to manage specific network functions. And I highlighted just a few below because uh, they do get involved when it comes to collaborations. So we have protocol subcommittees that are created for each study. They're the group that's, uh, you know, basically responsible for, you know, fleshing out the study design and overseeing the day-to-day -day, um, management of the study and then for presenting the primary and secondary analyses. We have a publications committee, concurrent research, and then we have two working groups, uh, biospecimens and bioinformatics working group, as well as a meta-analysis working group. So those can get involved with outside collaborations uh, for the biospecimens. For any new study that's designed, we look to see uh, if you know, the appropriate biospecimens are being collected and what those processing procedures are. Next slide. Okay, so as uh, Dr. Longo mentioned, um, the network has been ongoing for, I think we're now at 36 years. It's been a long time. So during the course of that, we've done 33 randomized trials and 25 observational studies. So uh, I was trying to figure out what might be the most relevant for this group. So we just decided to highlight studies that have involved therapeutics completed in the past 10 years. So most of these are randomized trials. So we did a randomized trial of antenatal late preterm pre steroids. Uh, the therapeutic was betamethasone. We do have a subset of biospecimens and we are currently following this cohort that uh, follow-up is supposed to be completed this summer. So we are following the children at six years and doing pulmonary function and neurocognitive uh, assessments at six years of age in that cohort. We also did a randomized trial uh, to prevent congenital cytomegalovirus. Um, so we were giving them CMV immune globulin. We do have biospecimens available on that and the mothers and children were followed through two years of age. One thing, um, the third study listed here is actually um, a follow-up uh, to the Obstetrics and Fetal Pharmacology Research Centers. They did a uh, Prevostatin trial, so small, I think probably, I don't think they were initially designed to be phase one, but they had these individual cohorts looking at different dosage of Prevostatin. So they looked at 10 milligrams, 20 milligrams, and they had just started to do a trial of 40 milligrams of Prevostatin. And so they um, stopped that 40 milligram cohort uh, and they had not planned to do an in-person follow-up on those children. Um, but on the next slide, which we'll get to in a second, the MFMU network uh, attempted to undertake a larger Prevostatin trial. And uh, so one of the things that the FDA had requested was for us to follow up these children. So the MFMU network actually followed up the children from this other network um, that had participated in these smaller Prevostatin trials. So it was, it was a really nice opportunity of collaboration between those two networks. And then we've done a trial of thy thyroxine therapy in both hypothyroxinemia and subclinical hypothyroidism. And then recently we just completed a trial looking at tranexamic acid to prevent obstetrical hemorrhage. Next slide. So we have several ongoing um, therapeutic studies. So we have our prescription after cesarean trial. So that is looking at oxycodone. Uh, I mentioned the prevostatin to prevent preeclampsia in high-risk women. And uh, so we do have biospecimens for that. Um, and we also are following the children up to two years of age. Um, the number of biospecimens is rather small because we have been stuck um, working with uh, the FDA because they have um, you know, not wanted us to recruit a large number of women for our trial. And then we do have a ongoing trial in twins uh, with uh, where the, the pregnant individual has a short cervix. And so we have a pessary, which is a device, but also looking at vaginal progesterone. And we do have some biospecimens. I also wanted to mention CAPS. Oh, sorry, one more. Um, it's the randomized trial of antioxidants to prevent preeclampsia. 
And the, coupled with that was a nested observational cohort study to predict preeclampsia. So this is definitely an older study. It was completed in 2008. So samples were collected between 2003 and 2008. So they are getting quite up there in age. But we have a lot of biospecimens that remain. Um, and I put like over 600,000 aliquots. So we have blood, uh, we have urine, we have some placenta. Uh, we have a lot of samples tied to that data set, even though those samples are older. Next slide. So just to highlight some unique resources, which I think we've heard in the other presentations from the other networks, uh, we, so we have de-identified data sets from our completed studies. We have availability of biospecimens for many of our studies. So I mentioned blood, urine, placenta. And then for several of our studies, we do have extended follow-up of the mothers and children. So we are able to have that linkage of maternal child data and some of the studies do have biospecimens. Next slide. And Dr. Longo, this is for you. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Patricia. So in conclusion, we, I mean, the network is uh, trying to address, uh, um, especially with some of the changes that are occurring, the vision, the 2020 strategic NICHD plan. And as Dr. Pawlowski was saying, uh, the goal is to conduct definitive, rigorous, reproducible, multi-site clinical trial, observational in pregnant and lactating people. Uh, by providing evidence to guide obstetric, obstetric pharmacology, and lactation uh, practice. And to do that, the goal, it will be to collaborate with the maternal and pediatric precision therapeutic, then print the neonatal research network, the help in trend addiction long-term, the research in uh, COVID to announce recovery, and of course, the other network that were present here today, which uh, um, I didn't list all of them. But I think the goal to move the needle, as I heard from some of the people, is actually getting to work with all this network and this infrastructure uh, together and being able to, to utilize and maximize what we are having uh, between the uh, regulatory agent and the um, university. Thank you for allowing us to present our part of the piece. Thank you. There, there is one question in the chat. How do we know um, that the biospecimen stored for years is still good for reliable data analysis? Includes quantification of other studies of medications and their stability in biological samples. Yes, that's one of the questions we get, and we are working every, um, I mean, we are depending on what is needed uh, and the study, like we're working with other uh, people requesting the sample and uh, um, they will have to uh, look into some of the sample preliminary and see. Some of them are very old and you know, if it's more than 10 years, depending on much, uh, the NICHD has a great repository that were people that have been kept, but there is, they need to be checked. Do the CAPS biospecimen have DNA available for genotyping? I believe they do, right, Rebecca? Yeah, for the subset that were in the observational yeah, some, uh, prediction yeah. study, we but did in the collect the group. Yeah, the citrate dex dextrose. Um, some of that has already been extracted for DNA, but not the vast majority no. of the samples. All right, thank you very much. We'll keep uh, looking through the chat to see if there's any additional questions for MFNU. Um, we're going to move on.